scientific phrase. A few weeks ago, I shared with you a, a biblical peek into what is awaiting believers in heaven. And I think we can all agree that our eternal home is a place beyond our wildest dreams and imaginations. Can't imagine. And God purposely gives us a glimpse of heaven in his holy text in order to motivate us as to how we should live our lives while we're still here as part of this world. Because heaven is the finish line awaiting some of us when we complete our race here on earth. It's the winner's circle for believers. <laughs> and like in any race, there are awards waiting to be given to the victors. And God is like the best of fathers. And any father wants their children to be winners. Amen. And he loves winners. He loves winners who overcome this world. And he loves his children to be able to leap over strongholds with a single bound. Yes, yes. And he wants his children to be able to tear down obstacles that are intended to keep you from following Jesus. And God the Father has special rewards waiting for all of his children who are able to do that. Of course, you know, there's religion. Those that are religious, those believers, they say that Christians should live out their lives out of the goodness of their hearts. You know, we shouldn't be seeking any award. We shouldn't be seeking any rewards. We don't need an incentive. We don't need a reward. You know, just avoiding hell should be our main incentive of why we're living here in this world. And serving, and serving God and being a child of God is our primary reward. And that sounds really good. It sounds really spiritual. But it's not in harmony with what the Bible teaches. Because our Father desires to bless His children and to reward His children that live faithful lives for His Son, Jesus Christ. Because our faith in Jesus Christ, His Son, it already qualifies us for everything that's awaiting for us in heaven. We're already going to get that. We've already got God's forgiveness. We've got his sanctification. We've got total salvation. We've got redemption. We've got justification. We've got righteousness. It's all ours. It's waiting for us already. But it's not what we did. It's what Christ did on the cross. Hallelujah. But God says there are rewards if you are faithful to Christ. You know, our faith in Christ brings us blessings, but our faithfulness to Christ makes, a, makes rewards available to you once you get to heaven. So you can believe in Christ. That, you're going to be blessed for that. That's salvation. But being faithful in your life to Christ, that can bring you rewards. Psalms 58, 11 says, There truly is a reward for those who live for God. And if we read Psalm 62, 12, it says, God repays all people according to what they have done. The Beatitudes, we all have studied the Beatitudes. If we read that, it's in Matthew 5. If we look at verses 11 and 12, we can find these words of encouragement. It says, God blesses you 
when people mock you. God will bless you when you're being persecuted. God will bless you when they lie about you and when they say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. It says, be happy about it. Be glad for the re great reward awaits you in heaven. He rewards people that go through persecution. God rewards those who live for him. And it's repeatedly expressed through our Bibles. Hebrews 6 verse 10 tells us, God will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love for him. He's not going to forget that. He is going to reward you. In Luke 18 verses 29 and 30, Jesus says, I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, that means you've sacrificed something in some way, they will be repaid many times over. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us that when we are raptured and we go to heaven, it says we must stand before Christ to be judged. And we will each receive whatever we deserve for good or evil that we have done in this earthly body. We're going to be rewarded or we're not going to be rewarded. And Romans 2, 6 repeats this. It says he will judge everyone according to what they have done. Now, each of us are going to have to give a personal account to God. That's called Judgment Day. And we can find in Romans 14, 12, this is about Judgment Day. It says, our hearts will be revealed as to why we did what we did, why we did what we did when we did it. Our hearts are going to be revealed. We're going to be judged. In Revelation chapter 22, this is the last book of the Bible, verse 12, Jesus tells us, Behold, I am coming quickly. How many people believe he's coming quickly? And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. He's coming quickly bringing his rewards with him. So in other words, a person's faithfulness determines what kind of rewards are waiting for them in heaven. Now we all love the Apostle Paul. Well, Paul joyfully declares his works and his sacrifices, and we can read it, of his declaration in 2 Timothy verse, chapter 4, <coughs> verses 7 through 9. And this is Paul speaking. He says, I have fought a good fight. Yes. I have finished the course. Mm -hmm. I have wow. kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, yes. which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, but not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. A crown of righteousness. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, Paul continues, he says, If any man's work which he has built on remains, because it's going to be tested by fire, he will receive a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, they're going to suffer loss. They're not going to be rewarded. So what is Paul talking about here? He's talking again about Judgment Day. All of the saints are going to have to stand before Jesus on Judgment Day, before the seat of Christ, and we're going to be judged based upon our faithfulness to God and our faithfulness to Jesus and remember, it's not our works that get us into yes. heaven, but our works determine 
the rewards we get once we are in a heaven. So what are those rewards? What are the rewards that are waiting for you? Well, again, the possibilities are greater than anything that you can imagine. 1 Corinthians 2.9 reassures us that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind can imagine what God has prepared for those who love Him. We can't even imagine the rewards piled up, waiting for us. I mean, the streets are made of gold. 1 Peter 2.9 tells us that we are a royal priesthood. That's one of the rewards waiting for us. Revelations 1.6 proclaims that Christ has made us kings and priests unto God. Yes. So we are kings, we are priests, we are a royal priesthood. So among the rewards waiting for us are crowns. Because we are kings. We are a priesthood. And the Bible speaks of five heavenly crowns. There could be more, but it only speaks of five, which are awarded to the children of God. Now I want you to know that these pieces, these crowns are not just pieces of jewelry to look pretty and shiny on top of your head. These crowns establish position and authority Amen. once you are in heaven. Amen. They signify the authority that you've been given in heaven based upon your works and your faithfulness while you were alive on earth. So let's look at these five crowns. The first crown that we know of is called the victor's crown. Sometimes it's called the incorruptible crown. And it's a crown given to saints who have sacrificed. They have sacrificed. They have learned how to live obediently before the Lord. They have given up certain pleasures in their life in order to better serve the Lord. These are Believers who have faithfully run the, run the race and they have cru crucified those selfish desires along the way. Mm -hmm. Desires of the flesh that would slow them down from finishing the race. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes God calls us to do things that require sacrifice. Are we going to be obedient and sacrifice in order to do those things? Some people may be called to be a missionary. They may be called to go to some distant land that's very poor. So in order to do that, they're going to have to sacrifice money. They're going to have to sacrifice possessions. They're going to have to sacrifice comfort. And they're going to have to give up whatever lifestyle that they had before taking off to this distant land. they got to give up that lifestyle that maybe they had here in America. They gotta put that behind them. And we can read about the victor's crown in 1 Corinthians chapter nine. This is 25 through 27, let me read it to you. And it compares to running the race. It says, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So here on earth you do things that are temporary, they're not gonna last very long. But as believers, we are running to this race for the awards that are eternal, that will last forever. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing, you're in the fight. You're doing this for real. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should do. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. And that's a scary thing for us pastors yes. to acknowledge. 
This reward will be given to all believers who run the race all the way to the finish line. These are people who are able to discipline their flesh. They make their flesh their slave instead of the other way around. They have the flesh serve the Lord. But then you've got to realize in order for your flesh to serve the Lord, that can only be achieved by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, thank you, Jesus. So you don't accomplish this. You don't finish this race. You don't get this award on your own strengths, on your own merits. You are able to accomplish and finish this race based upon God's powers, not our own. And as Christians, we've got to be able to say no to some things. We've got to be able to say no to some things in order to be able to say yes to other things. Sometimes we've got to turn off the TV and spend time with God. We might have to have the laundry pile up another day. Or put off cutting the lawn today so that we can go to church and that we can fellowship with our other brothers and sisters. Yeah, the grass needs to be cut, but it will wait a day. You might have to get up early in the morning instead of sleeping in so that you can have prayer time with the Lord. I know people that do that. Sometimes when you find somebody who is hurting, they're sick, they're troubled, they're stressed out, you've got to stop whatever you are doing. And you've got to take that opportunity to share the love of Jesus with them. Pray over them. Spend time letting the Holy Spirit come into their life. Maybe they have never been introduced to the Holy Spirit. That's an opportunity to do so. Maybe give up your Sunday afternoons to go down to the oceanfront and feed the homeless. Sacrifice. And sacrifice takes discipline. If you cannot discipline yourself, then you cannot expect to win this reward. You cannot expect to be given this crown of victory. Because this crown is given to those who are able to discipline the body, they're able to discipline the mind, they're able to keep the body under their control and not the other way around. Because most bodies, most bodies strive to do those things that provide momentary pleasure, you know, just brief pleasures in life. But a true athlete, they know that they need to run when their body just wants to rest. Most people are slaves to the wants and the desires of the body, but they need to take better control. They need to discipline themselves if the crown of victory is going to be waiting for them. A second crown is called the crown of rejoicing. It is given to those who faithfully witness to other people all about Christ and Christ's love and Christ's salvation. It is given to those who lead other people to Jesus. The crown of rejoicing. Paul tells us in Thessalonians 1, he's, he's talking to the Thessalonians. This is Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. He says, you yourselves are our witnesses, and so is God. This is that judgment day. That we were devout and honest and faultless toward all of you believers. So the Thessalonians are going to be witnesses in heaven of everything that Paul did. Verse 19 adds, it says, after all, what gives us hope and joy, and what will be our crown of rejoicing? As we stand before our Lord Jesus, it will be you. You will be 
our reward. You will be our witness. So he's telling the Thessalonians that one day he's going to be awarded this crown of rejoicing because he preached the gospel to them and he discipled them and he helped them grow in their faith and in their belief. And he's saying that the Thessalonians, because he led them to the Lord, are going to be his witnesses when he gets to heaven. Standing before Jesus and declaring the works of Paul to the Lord on Judgment Day. He says, it is you. You are my hope and joy. You are my joy when I stand before the Lord because you are going to be my witnesses. Thank you. <laughs> You've all got witnesses, hopefully, waiting in heaven to share of the great works that you did for them. So brothers and sisters, it takes, it takes heart. We've got to take to heart God's mandate. God tells us that we are supposed to go into all nations and share the good news. Well, if you do that, if you go out and share the good news, you share the, the good news of salvation and Jesus Christ, well, you probably have the crown of rejoicing waiting for you in heaven. The third crown is the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness is reserved for those who are looking and they are waiting on Christ's return. And while they are waiting, they are righteous. They are righteous. They live righteous lives for the Lord while they wait for the Lord to come. Now, sadly, there's a lot of people who are saved, but they continue to do evil works. They continue to sin, just like anybody else, just like unbelievers. There are those that continue to sin. They are not living righteous lives. Now, granted, we all have weaknesses. We all have those temptations. You know, they're individual temptations. We all have probably different ones. But God isn't looking for perfection. He's not looking for perfection in the way that you live your life. He's looking for the direction that you take your life. He just wants to make sure that you are doing everything that you can to choose the right path, to make the right decisions, to make the right choice. And like I said, there will be temptations. You will be forgiven. And we'll try to do better the next time. Second Timothy verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 8 says, And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. So this is waiting for you on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Look forward to his appearing, and they live lives of righteousness. And then there's the crown of glory. The crown of glory is also called the shepherd's crown. And it has to do with people who teach who pastor, or who in some manner or fashion they minister to and they lead the flocks of Christ. But you don't have to be a pastor to receive the crown of glory. You could be a children's church worker. You could lead a Bible study. Main thing is that you care about your group care about your little flock. You prepare weekly to serve them. You know each and every individual in your group. You pray for them. You counsel them. You teach them. You know their struggles. You know their challenges, their passions, their gifts. 
Well, let me read to you what it says in 1 Peter 5 about this crown. It says, you care for the flock that God has entrusted to you, whether it's a Bible study or a children's Sunday school class or, or leading worship. You watch over it willingly, not grudgingly. It's not something that you're forced to do. Not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. You do it cheerfully. You don't lord over the people assigned to your care. You're not some kind of dictator telling them what they can or they cannot do. But you lead them by your own good example. That's kind of tough sometimes. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. Never-ending glory. But Jesus warns us that you, in order to get this crown, the things that you are doing is because you want to be doing them, and you're doing them cheerfully, not because you've been told to do them. And you don't do them out of greed. I'm doing it because I'm getting paid to do it. No, you do it because you want to serve the Lord. That doesn't mean you can't get paid. It's just that's not your motive. Don't be rulers over the people who are entrusted to you. And like I said, be examples to the flock of the behaviors and the lifestyle that they need to follow. And then the great shepherd, when he appears, he's going to award you the crown of never-ending glory. So if you are teaching God's word and you're teaching it out of love, and if you're giving them the proper example of how to live their lives, you've probably got the crown of glory waiting for you in heaven. And then there's the final crown that we know of called the crown of life. Now this crown is given in recognition of enduring and triumphing over trial and temptation and persecution. It is given to people who are going through hardships, who have endured tribulation, and maybe they've even been martyred because of their faith for the sake of the cross. You know, being willing, to, being willing to die because of your faith in God is probably the most, the most ultimate sacrifice that any believer can give up and share. It's the greatest act of courage. James 1, chapter, uh, verse 12 says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Anybody being tested here? Afterwards, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. We can also read of the crown of life when we look in Revelation. This is, I think it's chapter 2, verse 10. It might be 22. I think it's probably 22. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. That means it's only temporary. It's not forever. We all go through things. There's seasons. When morning comes, there's joy. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. When you go through tr struggles and you know the persecutions that you go through in life, and we all go through those, and you keep your faith and you keep your trust in Jesus, you turn to Jesus, you spend time with Jesus in prayer, you will be awarded with the crown of life because you overcame the world. And you overcame the persecutions that we face in this life. 
a crown of life. It's for those people who gave themselves to God. They didn't give themselves to the world. So these are the five crowns. These are the crowns that we know of that are mentioned by name in our Bibles. Now Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15, he tells us how our works will be judged. And he says they're going to be judged, they're going to be put to the fire to see if they withstand holiness and righteousness. It says, if the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be thrown into hell. That just means the rewards that you could have gotten that would last throughout of eternity, you don't get. So in other words, as our works face the fire of God and then we are judged, some of us are going to get into heaven smelling like smoke. <laughs> now, is that the way you want to get into heaven? You know, by the skin of your teeth? <laughs> so I want to emphasize once again that it's not by our works, but it's by the works of Jesus Christ on the cross that we are in heaven. And it's through God's grace and His mercy and the works of Jesus on the cross. And when we accept Jesus as our Savior, our works indicate that we have changed. We are no longer that old person. We are no longer the old man. We are a new creation. And you can see the new creation in our works. Because we have become His and we are devoting our lives to Him. And we are overcoming the temptations of the flesh. Amen. We are overcoming the world. Okay. So what are we going to do once we are given these crowns? Think about it. We're in heaven. God has given you Everything that you can imagine, things you can't even imagine, are waiting for you in heaven. And it's given to you. It's given to you. Because you put your trust and your faith and your life into Jesus' hands. But these crowns, these crowns are the only things that you have earned. Everything else is given to you. But your works have earned you one or more of these crowns. Revelations 4, this is verses 10 through 11, it says, The 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, and they lay their crowns before the throne. And they say, you are worthy, O oh Lord, our God. You are worthy to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. So after we receive our crimes, we're going to fall down. going to fall down before Jesus and we're going to give him our crowns. That's the only thing that we have. We don't have anything else. And we're going to express our thanksgiving. You know, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving a wretch like me. You know, thank you, Lord, for forgiving my sins. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Thank you, Lord, for being my redeemer. I don't have anything of my own to give you but this crown. 
take my crown. You know, maybe you remember an old spiritual hymn titled Crown Him with Many Crowns. Did you ever sing that? Something like this. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon the throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but his own. Awake my soul and king, of him who died for thee. And hail him as the matchless king through all. <laughs> that was about Judgment Day. You may not have known that. Now, I personally confess that when I get to heaven, something to Jesus. Amen. I want to be able to give something to Jesus for all that he has given to me. Amen. And I want to have witnesses there speaking for me like Paul did. I don't want to be standing in front of him with nothing to give. No crowns, no rewards, yeah, because I lived a foolish, lazy life. I don't want to get into heaven smelling like smoke. <laughs> Even though I've been saved. And I also pray that one day when I am in heaven, that I am your witness. that I hear Jesus say to each and every one of you, even if you're listening to this message today, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over the small things. This earth is the small things. I will make you ruler over much. Amen. So there is a crown, hopefully you more than one crown awaiting each and every one of you in heaven. So, I pray that we don't waste our lives here and show up into heaven by the skin of our teeth with a trail of smoke like those <laughs> planes that you see in the sky, those little vapor trails. <laughs> And that you've got something to give back to Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, I, 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 I. so he's coming soon. Amen. And we're going to sing that now, right? Soon and very soon he is coming. You got something you want to share? And it's all yours. Thank you. Tilt the microphone down. There you go. <laughs> it just blocks the shine off my head. It's fine. <laughs> you know, for about 20 years, I've had this reoccurring dream. And even though the location was a little bit different or the people involved in the dream, most of the time it was my relatives, even though that was different, the, there was one similar thing about this dream that I've had often for about 20 years now. And that was... I had this home that was mine, and it was huge. And when it first, the dreams first started, they was like my grand, my grandmother's and grandfather's house. Because I, if I ever think back in life, when was I the happiest, the best times of my life? It was at grandma's house in North Carolina. I just loved that house. I loved being there. And the dream started at being grandma's house. 
but it wasn't quite completely finished, so to speak. I could go up the steps, but all of the rails didn't go all the way up to the top. And I could look to the outside, all of the walls wasn't there. So I, I think it was preparing me to saying, this is a great place, and this is going to be your place, and, and as soon as it's going to be done. And the dreams continued on, you know, over many, many years where one time the dream it was the home that was going to be mine was like a warehouse it was massive with great big tall ceilings and the walls uh -huh. were wide open massive i even had one dream i was so excited it was like a little small uh chrysler hall and with the slanted floor and, it, and you know, i could look down at this big wide open area down at the end i was thinking wow what kind of jam sessions can i have in here and yes. get all my friends over to play music well, just recently, when I was preparing what I was going to speak to y'all for communion just a few weeks ago, it was revealed to me about those dreams that I've been having for 20 years. And there's also something else that was very similar in all these dreams that I never really thought about. That was in every one of these dreams, with all of the excitement, and oh, this is going to be my home, this is where I'm going to live, they were all empty every one of them there wasn't nothing in any of the houses no furnishings whatsoever and i come to realize that yes we do have a promise of a home in heaven uh, you know jesus said said in my father's house there's many mansions and i go to prepare a place for you and if it weren't so i would have told you but where i go you can go and be with me also we have that promise we got that home but I can't help but think that what we do here in this life on this earth contributes to the furnishings of that new home. Mm -hmm. We have to do things. And just like I decided that one time that the next time I come to the river room for communion, I was going to be ready and I could take it with a sincere heart. Well, I've decided that I'm going to do everything that I can from here on to try to <clears throat> put furnishings in my new home in heaven. Amen. 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 That's what we all need to be doing. Amen. It kind of ties in with those rewards. Rose has got something to share too. I told you earlier, Rose was going to have something to reveal to us. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Glory, hallelujah. I could not stop weeping as Pastor Ray was sharing about the crown. The Lord spoke to me a few years ago, because it's clear he said, today you will receive your crown. Amen. Okay. He did not identify which crown. So I, I did some research and I have in my Bible all the crowns that Pastor Ray uh, mentioned and I have the scriptures to back it up. But one day the Holy Spirit woke me up with 1 Corinthians 9, 16. And that scripture said, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe be unto me that I preach not the gospel. Amen. I received Jesus at 19 years of old, 19 years of age. This would be my year of jubilee. Okay. I've been saved. Amen. <laughs> to God be the glory. And when I accepted Christ into my heart, I knew that it was not just for me. I immediately started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Lord spoke to me audibly one day and said, go ye into the world and preach the gospel of the Yoshaka. <laughs> the audible voice of God, I didn't even know the Lord speak to people like that. And this lady I saw on YouTube, and I have shared it with someone also, that the voice of God, when I heard the voice in the Ten Commandments, giving Moses the Ten Commandments, that voice is similar to the voice of God. 
So I said, Lord, someone had a revelation. When the Lord told me, go into the world and preach the gospel, I was already preaching the gospel, but it was like he was imparting an anointing on me. He told me, I had placed upon you the anointing of the evangelistic anointing. And when I was living in Chicago, oh my goodness, when they said the windy city, it was like so cold and I didn't have a car. And of course I was persecuted because I did not have a car. I could afford a car, but the Lord did not lead me to get a car. And uh, some friends called and I, we're not going to pick you up because you know you should have had a car and you're just afraid your credit won't get passed. And, and I was like, Lord. He said, why are they talk to my God said they don't know me. And not that they did not know God, but they didn't know how God was working in my life. And the Lord spoke to me a few years later. He said, how would they have known the word if you had not been on the bus, on the train, in the car, in the cold. On the train, on the bus, in the cold. He said, they receive, how do you They receive the word you gave them. Amen. He said, you have carried my glory. I was a loan officer in Evergreen Park in Illinois, and it was cold. And it was like a 45-minute ride from my home in Richmond Park to, to Evergreen Park. And I had got the bus. The bus ride was about, I guess, 15 minutes or so, and then I had to get the train. But this particular day... It was extremely cold. It was in the winter time. And if you don't make that connection, the bus don't get there at that time, um, you will miss, you would have to wait two hours. Oh in this cold place with the concrete floor and it's freezing. And I did not feel like witnessing to anybody. But I realized that the Lord is not about me. This particular time, I didn't want to going there, I got on the bus, and I just drove to the next uh, stop while I catch the train. And the, um, it took, it was like a comprehensive view of the South Suburban area. And it was freezing cold, and by the time I got to my stop, a four to five minute ride took like three and a half hours uh, trip from, from my job to my home. When I got to my train station, I was going up, when the bus let me off at the train, I was going up this ramp, and my fingers were frozen, my feet were frozen, and I said, Father, this doesn't make good sense. I said, the only way it's gonna make sense, and there's a soul on that platform. Oh. When I got up there, there was one soul. And I said, young man, I said, my name is Rosa. What's your name? He said, Chris. I said, Chris, are you saved? Oh, I'm all right. Mm -hmm. I want to say, I want to grab him. No, you're not all right. You all messed up. You tore up, fall up to. I was like, you all messed up. I said, you know what, Chris? I said, a four to five minute ride has turned to three and a half hours. I said, before the foundation of the world, Jesus knew that I was going to be here. I said, the kingdom of God has come to you today. Amen. I said, because the Bible said, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised us from the dead, you shall be saved. I said, the word said, whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I said, a lot of people say, oh, I know him. I said, but he says, men has received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I said, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is it's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. To God be the glory. At first he was like really didn't want to hear it. Then all of a sudden he just lit up. To God be the glory. And then the train came. He said thank you. And <laughs> I was so frozen. But do you not know, I said, Lord, when that, and my train came shortly that I, I told the Lord, it was so cold, I said, when I get to Richmond Park, I'm going to catch a ta taxi. <laughs> when I got to Richmond Park, I, I literally skipped home. I mean, I was thawed out, <laughs> was no longer frozen, to God be the glory. So I say to you today, 
the kingdom of God is in us. And we have a sense of urgency in this hour to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because we are so near to the second coming of Christ. He's coming. The Lord said he's coming. He's coming. He's coming like a thief in the night. Be ready. Amen. All right. Very good.